Good evening and welcome to Altos, your weekly Catholic News TV program here on Trinity TV and now broadcast on TTT. I'm Roger Sands sitting in for your regular anchor, Neil Parsonlal. Here are our top stories. Catholics in Grenada are praying for a resolution following the decision by the bishop to suspend a priest from his ministry. The Feast of Divine Mercy was celebrated last Sunday. We visit San Fernando, Grand Coover, and Malabar for some celebrations. There may be good news for children of Venezuelan migrants regarding their education. We'll tell you more. And later we connect with the General Manager of Child Welfare Services at the Children's Authority, Rhonda Gregoire Rupchan, to discuss some more about the issues affecting children in Trinidad and Tobago. Our top story comes out of Grenada, where diocesan priest Father Gerard Paul has been suspended from his priestly ministry indefinitely, effective April 4th. The announcement came from Bishop Clyde Harvey of St. George's in Grenada in a statement released on Saturday. Catholic News editor Raymond Sims has more. According to Bishop Harvey, the decision to suspend Father Paul is not solely based on his remarks at the March 27th Christmas and subsequent statements on various media platforms. Rather, it stems from what Bishop Harvey describes as Father Paul's persistent attacks on the Catholic Church and its leadership. Over the past 10 days, Father Paul has expressed his views in ways that seem to mock authority. Respect for authority is one of the pillars of civilized society. When such respect is undermined without being addressed, the end result could only be a total breakdown of society. This applies to all sectors. Bishop Harvey clarified that the suspension of a priest from ministry is not to be confused with dismissal from the priesthood. Father Paul will no longer serve as a parish priest and will be unable to preside at the church's sacred rites, including masses, funerals, weddings, baptisms, and more, until, as Bishop Harvey stated, he seeks the help he needs to potentially return to ministry in the future. And on his weekly program on Thursday, the bishop describes the last few days as painful for everyone, but saw the positives. But let me say this in conclusion. I thank God for so many things that have happened over these days. So many things. You know, this morning after church, a little lady comes and she hugs me up, you know. Bishop, I never touched you before, but I pray in faith. You know, I mean, these little things that happen. And then, of course, the call to conscience, where you examine your conscience and you ask yourself, how have I failed? And I said to the priest two days ago, and I say to all of you now, Father Gerard Paul is still a priest of the church. He is still, for me, a brother in the priesthood. And the rest is up to him and up to God. Amen. Amen. I am Raymond Sims for Catholic News Altos. The Ministry of National Security has given the green light for Venezuelan migrants' children meeting requirements to begin entering Catholic primary schools in the new academic year in September. Lara Pickford-Gordon has more. Over two weeks ago, Chief Executive Officer of the Catholic Education Board of Management, Sharon Mangrew, received the news that migrant children can be integrated into any government or government-assisted school. We have recommended highly that we start with the 18 schools, Catholic schools, that have been prepared to receive them. And so what we are awaiting now is final words from the Ministry of National Security as to the documentation that is required. We have a good sense of that. The children eligible to enter schools must have been documented in the government's migrant registration framework which took place May 31st to June 14, 2019. 16,523 Venezuelans were registered in that exercise. We have about 150 children ready. Um, the documentation is ready. The children have been assessed so that we know what level of English they are able to speak. And our teachers have been trained. Resources have been provided to the school. The Catholic Board is willing to facilitate a smooth process of registering students for schools, after which it is hoped this distribution of student permits from the Ministry of National Security will take about a month. 
we expect that before the term ends, we will at least have people knowing what school they're going to be starting. I am Laura Pickford-Gordon for Catholic News, Altos. The church celebrated the Feast of Divine Mercy last Sunday with observances across the country. We go first to San Fernando where the Zion RC community and the Southern Vicariate hosted a prayer walk and mercy celebration. The walk we be began at Our Lady of Perpetual Help on the promenade and ended at Presentation San Fernando. Videographer Barry Sedano has more. So my brothers and sisters, this Divine Mercy is not a slipshot, piecemeal, one today, one tomorrow kind of mercy. God's mercy, my brothers and sisters, that endures forever is exactly what it means and what the psalmist says it means. This Divine Mercy, my brothers and sisters, is day in, day out. It is even when I don't feel it, He's offering it. It's even when I don't deserve it, He's offering it. It's not because of my goodness, but it's in spite of my sinfulness. Yeah. That's God's mercy. That's why, my brothers and sisters, nobody can give mercy but God. God. We don't have the power to do it. And at the Santa Rosa and Malabar RC clusters, Divine Mercy Celebration started with a mercy walk. It was followed by a talk from recently ordained priest Father Maurice White and Winston Garcia from the People of Praise community. Laura Pickford-Gordon tells us more. Being a disciple of Christ is not easy, and the faithful have to dig deep to follow Christ's example of mercy. This starts in the family. There's so many families with so many open wounds where people don't understand one another and they're doing things to each other that are, that are not right. But you know, who we must re rely on is Jesus Christ on that cross. God is inviting the faithful to cooperate with his mercy and be willing to encounter the brokenness in the Zacchaeuses around them. When you look up to somebody and you can draw out from them all the beauty and the majesty and the power that they are as a human person and you can amplify that and glorify that and you can magnify that in and through God. I am Laura Pickford-Gordon for Catholic News, Altos. And Father Trevor Nattersing has lamented that the state of sin in Trinidad and Tobago now makes this country worse off than Sodom and Gomorrah. But he says God is withholding his hand of judgment against us because of his love and mercy. Father Nattersing was speaking at the annual Divine Mercy celebrations in La Vega on Sunday. <laughs> Hundreds gathered from various parts of the country for a day of prayer and reflection, praise and worship, and benediction which preceded Mass. Father Trevor spoke of the spate of crime in the country, lamenting that two people had died in his parish following a fire bombing at a home, and he recoiled at how society has deteriorated since the times of the early Christians. The early Christian community lived in fellowship and unity. They shared what they had, they looked out for each other, they cared for each other. They were there for each other. To the point where if we try to do that today, they will call us fanatics. In the face of the present darkness in the world today, Father Nata Singh implored the faithful to be agents of mercy and to extend forgiveness and compassion even to those deemed unworthy. And he said, every time we leave church, we are entrusted with a task. Go by the rum shop and drink rum, no. We give you a task. Go in peace 
the love and self. Go in peace to glorify the Lord. Go in peace to bear witness to God. Go in peace. He asked the faithful to not squander this day of grace, to go forth from this place filled with mercy received, and let it be the guiding force in all that we do. A grandmother's inspiration, a soon-to-be 21-year-old, will be running 21 kilometers on her birthday next week to mark the occasion. But her run is more than just a run. She has decided to use the birthday run to raise funds for a teacher in need of a liver transplant. Here's more. Abigail Corby started running eight months ago, inspired by her grandmother, who is a fitness enthusiast. Now she's challenging herself to a half marathon or 21K. Ultimately, I was just inspired by my granny and seeing her run and wanting to push myself and to train hard. So I just came up with something that I knew wasn't something that I was capable of at the time, but I knew that I'd have to work hard towards it in order to achieve it. Grandma Margaret said Abigail, who was only running 5Ks at the start of the year, has gradually added the mileage and the challenge. Every day I saw her improve to the extent that she started outrunning me and I couldn't keep up with her. <laughs> So um, when she came home and she told me that she decided she wanted to run her, the 21K for her 21st birthday, I wasn't really surprised at all. The run, which will take place in Shagaramas, is being used as a fundraiser for Fatima business teacher Alicia Manuel, who requires an urgent liver transplant. She has dedicated her life to her students. And this is our way of giving back to her and helping her in a time of need. She is in Canada at the moment running tests and preparing for that transplant surgery. So for us, it's just about getting her the funds to be able to cover that surgery, yeah. In news from Rome, the document Dignitas Infinitia, released on Monday by the Dicastri for the Doctrine of Faith, asserts fundamental human dignity amidst some of the pressing ethical concerns of the times. The document includes themes like trafficking, digital bullying, abortion, surrogacy, and gender ideology. Here is more from Rome Reports. The Vatican published the document Dignitas Infinita. It outlines the serious violations against human dignity, which it says are often mistaken for the whims or desires of individuals. The prefect for the doctrine of the faith, Cardinal Victor Manuel Fernandez, used the example of surrogacy, where the legitimate desires of the parents to have children turn the baby into a commodity, annulling its dignity. This does not mean not understanding the sensitivity of the person who desires a child that is truly his or her own. But there is an invitation to go beyond this desire, because we are talking about the dignity of the person, which is a much bigger thing than the desire of any one person. But this practice is only one of the grave violations against human dignity listed in this Vatican document. Another is gender ideology, which the Cardinal described as a danger. He said it eliminates the main difference between man and woman, gender. It is true that there are at least two reasons not to accept gender ideology, two reasons that we develop here, because we believe that these ideologies, instead of helping to recognize dignity, they impoverish a humanistic vision where man and woman make the most beautiful encounter of the greatest difference that humanity contains. This is unparalleled. In this context, the idea of same-sex marriage or the very elimination of differences does not seem acceptable. Nevertheless, the prefect clarified that the church must welcome people regardless of their situation and that persecuting people because of their sexual orientation must be avoided. We'll take a short break and when we return, we chat with Rhonda Gregoire Rupchan from the Children's Authority about ongoing issues involving children's care in TNT. And as we go to that break, here's a look at the trivia question.
And welcome back to Altos. And joining us now as we jump into a discussion is Rhonda Gregoire Rupchan, the General Manager, Child Welfare Services at the Children's Authority. As we continue to look at children's issues here in Trinidad and Tobago. Rhonda, thank you very much for joining us. We know um, your time is, is precious as you continue your important work at the Authority. Recently, your director, Mr. Cyrus, was quoted as saying that um, there is a crisis involving children and tr children's care in Trinidad mm -hmm. and Tobago. Tell us a little bit more about that, because almost weekly, a couple times a week, we hear about horrific issues um, where children are abused um, and, 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 and really terrible things are happening with children in Trinidad and Tobago. Give us some more details from the authorities' point of view about the situation. Certainly. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me. Uh, the authority is really experiencing uh, a real call to fulfill its mandate in that we have to care for, provide care and protection for all children who are re reported to be abused or maltreated. And over the years, the authority has seen an increase in the number of cases coming to us. Annually, we are up to an average of almost 5,000 cases coming to us. And that means that as a society, we really need to do better. We have a lot of responsibility in caring for children. The types of cases coming to us at the authority right now fall very heavily in the category of sexual abuse, physical abuse, and neglect of our children. And in each month, we can have an average of 400 cases coming to us of children who have been reported to be abused or maltreated. So really, it is, from the authority's point of view, a growing challenge, but it's also one that we take on with our stakeholder, our stakeholder partners, because our mantra is we must focus on the best interests of the child, but also that child protection is everybody's business. And so we want to engage the public in this month, um, Child Abuse Prevention Awareness Month, to make sure that everyone knows and is aware of how they can do their part to help to reduce the number of abuse cases coming to us. So you said 5,000. Over what period of time? Mm -hmm. uh, w w that is an looking? annual figure, and the Annu monthly figure is just about 400, between four and 500. So is it that more cases are being reported now because of, of greater access to technology, you have a hotline, etc., or is mm -hmm. it that more abuse is happening? Yeah, I would want to say that we are now becoming more aware and more persons are reporting because they have an avenue to do so. We still suspect that in certain areas there is some level of under-reporting, but we have known that child abuse and mistreatment of children has been in most of our lives, we've been aware, but now we are speaking out about it and providing an avenue for us to be able to treat with the matter and provide for children. There's also a lot of sensitization and campaigns going on from the authority and even at our, with our partners. Um, for example, in our line ministry, um, Gender and Child Affairs Office of the Prime Minister, where we are joining together to make sure that members of the public know about child abuse, that children know their rights and their responsibilities, and that persons know how to report child abuse. And so that's my view of an increase in the numbers that we're seeing. Right, and tell us a little bit about the relationship between the police service and the Children's Authority, because I want to think mm -hmm. when there's an issue of, of possible violence against children abuse, most people may rep make a report to the police uh, in their district. Do the police, mm -hmm. I know they have a, a special unit as well that deals mm -hmm. with children. What's that relationship w w like, and is it, does it need to be strengthened between the police and the authority? Absolutely. The police, particularly the Child Protection Unit, and more so the Special Victims Unit, which now incorporates the um, Child Protection Unit as well as the Domestic Violence Unit, we are very close partners, very, very close partners. And it was anticipated and continues to grow that we intervene on cases together as far as our resources um, allow. The police report all cases of abuse into the authorities hotline and vice versa. The role of the police is criminal investigation. They are the ones that deal with the perpetrator and bringing charges. The role of the authority is psychosocial investigation, focusing on the needs of the child. But you would appreciate that these two go hand in hand to bring true justice and to ensure that prevention of child abuse is a feature of our um, joint activity. So yes, there's close collaboration with the police, and there's also built out mm, mm, sorry, memorandums of understanding, as well as um, 
process agreements between us where we can work together as best as possible on all cases of abuse, but also on specific issues affecting both of our um, entities. And when we look at uh, Trinidad and Tobago as part of the region, we, we, the, the Caribbean, we have a, a similar type of cultural and societal um, background. Do we stand mm -hmm. out or what's the situation when we look at the rest of the Caribbean and child abuse and, and some of the things that are happening with our children? The research that we've done so far um, and looking at the cases that we received is showing that there is quite a number of similarities in the trends that we are seeing across the Caribbean and some of our international best practice and evidence-based work which is what we use to guide our own process tells us that some of the trends we are seeing are quite similar. What is concerning and what is important is that we know how to treat with abuse and how to engage the public to make sure that members of the public know when they see an abuse what to do, who to call, when they call, what is going to happen, and how can they have a role in supporting a child. The authority has recently signed off on the National uh, Protocol for Child Abuse Prevention and Management, and that aims to show both the public and members of our child protection ecosystem, all the people who work in child protection, what do we do, where our part starts, where our part ends, so that a child being reported to us can really have the best experience and the most efficient experience because we are working together. So the trends we are seeing mirror what is in, in happening in Trinidad and we are addressing it by making sure that collaboration is happening amongst the stakeholders in child protection, including the police. And you talk about collaboration. Tell us a little bit about the school system and the authority, because I want to think as well mm -hmm. that a lot of the children are maybe in the school system and are teachers, for example, equipped to mm -hmm. identify um, students who may be um, undergoing issues at home. The authority works very closely as well with the school system, the Ministry of Education. As a matter of fact, just this week, we are looking at refining our memorandum of understanding to make sure that it is meeting the needs of our collaboration. The authority also works closely with student support services, which has similar um, practitioners as some of the units in the authority. So their social workers, their guidance officers, their special education teachers, so that we have a collaborative relationship where we understand how we can work together and that maps out from the very beginning at administrative officers in the organization to those on the ground. So there is a collaboration and we work very closely in particular with student support services and school supervision to make sure children get things like enrollment in school, reporting of abuse, going out on intervention together, and essentially making the interventions very reactive and supportive of the children who are being reported to us. There was a, another case this week of a child, unfortunately, um, being beheaded. Mm -hmm. I, I guess it, it, it's, it, it continues to be an, an issue that the authority has to deal with. How do you yes. deal with a situation like that where you're hearing different mm -hmm. views from the, the two parents of the child? Sure. Yeah. Um, and that, that is quite usual in that, you know, in every story, there's uh, uh, many versions of the truth. And so the emergency response team of the authority treats with such matters and aims to do that within 24 hours of receipt of the report. And what they do is triangulate the information. The authority is guided by legislation and the law allows us to explore many avenues to get at what is the real truth and most importantly, what is in the best interest of the child. That includes interviews with parents, with child in particular, um, in this instance, that would not have been um, possible, uh, with any other collateral sources of information so that we really triangulate the information. We get to understand what is in the best interest of the child. And so we acknowledge that different persons may have different versions of the story. Our view is to get to the bottom of what is actually happening in relation to the child, substantiate the allegation that was reported to us, and see what the needs of the child are, irrespective of any varying stories from reporting parties. And about a year ago, the authority uh, met with the Archdiocese of Fort of Spain mm -hmm. to look at ways of improving child care in Trinidad and Tobago. Mm -hmm. The Archdiocese, mm -hmm. the, the Catholic Church in Trinidad and Tobago, sure. runs several children care homes. Um, what mm -hmm. um, are the fruits of, 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 of that collaboration which happened mm -hmm. about a year ago? 
Okay, so that discussion was just prior to engaging in a proclamation of a particular part of the legislation that led to all homes, all community residences within Trinidad and Tobago being um, licensed so that they can practice under the monitoring and um, support of the authority as well as the Office of the Prime Minister on Gender and Child Affairs. So that discussion really did bear a lot of fruit because we explored ways that we can support the various children's homes to be able to make sure they meet all of the standards to be able to provide the best possible care for the children. To date, all homes in Trinidad and Tobago have been licensed. And so we continue to look for ways that we can collaborate together. Also, in particular air groups, for example, the migrant population, we have quite a number of reports in that area. And so we get a lot of support and collaboration from the church in regard to supporting those and other clients. And, and finally, you mentioned earlier, this is Child Abuse uh, Month. Uh, do, yes. Does the authority have any specific public outreach programs they're doing? And what would you um, tell the average person out there who wants to report a case of child abuse? Yeah. What would be their go-to? Okay. If you want, if you know, if you suspect, if you only think that a child's case, a child is experiencing any kind of abuse, we are asking mandatory reporting is to the police for sexual offenses. You do not have to investigate. You do not have to know the full truth. All you have to do is have a suspicion and allow the entities like the authority, like the police to follow up. You can reach us at the Children's Authority at 996 or 800 2014 2014 and you can make a report. You can walk into us and we will look into the matter as best as we can, as quickly as we can, to explore how we can provide support for children reported to us. And any outreach happening um, for this month by the authority? We continue to do quite a number of outreach elements. In this month, we are doing TV um, sessions pretty much like this one at um, various um, media houses. We are also doing a number of caravans. We're doing a campaign with the Office of the Prime Minister as well, where we go into various communities to share on child abuse, child prevention. Um, and we are also very active on our social media platforms as well to be able to share information, not only on child abuse prevention, but on foster care, kinship foster care, as well as the adoption process to make sure that every child has an opportunity to have a forever home as well. Okay, well, that's where we have to leave it. Thank you very much, Rhonda Gregoire Rupchan, General Manager, Child Welfare Services at the Children's Authority. Thank you for your time you. and sharing your expertise. We'll be right back on Altos much. after this break. We are taking a leap of faith on Trinity TV. Jump in with us for this new and exciting experience. Welcome back to Altos. Well, book the date Saturday, May 11th, 4.30 at the Queen's Park Savannah. The first Catholic News 5K and 1K. It's called Steps for Hope. The 1K starts at 3.30. It's for children 12 and under, and the 5K is at 4.30. Please register as soon as possible. Spaces are limited. Head over to baffasports.com to register. The funeral for the late former Chief Justice Michael de Labastide was celebrated on Thursday, April 11th at the Church of the Assumption in Maraval. Justice de Labastide died on March 30th at the age of 86 after ailing for some time. He was the Chief Justice of Trinidad and Tobago from 1995 to 2002 and served as the first President of the Caribbean Court of Justice from 2005 to 2011. Archbishop Charles Jason Gordon preached the homily at the funeral mass. Michael's life means anything to you at all. If his living has made a deep impression on you professionally and a deep impression on you in the quality of his intellect and the quality of his character as he stood for values that were unshakable for him and, and non-negotiable. If, if that has made an impression upon you, then I beg you also, allow the ending of his life to make an impression upon you. May he rest in peace and condolences to the family. We take a look now at a couple of our clergy members celebrating their anniversaries in the Archdiocese. We say congratulations to Father Gerard Bernier and Father Curtis Poyer celebrating 39 years of priestly ordination on Sunday, April 14th. 
And let's take a look as well at some of the activities and events in the Ash Diocese in the coming week. And make sure and pick up your copy of the Catholic News this weekend as you head to Mass. Editor Raymond Sims tells us what's inside. In the April 14th issue of the Catholic News, read about the artist Tremaine Fraunfelder, creator of Beautiful Miniatures, and our coverage of Divine Mercy celebrations in Grand Couva and Malabar Arena. I am Raymond Sims, editor of the Catholic News. And that brings us to the end of our program for this week. We thank you for staying with us.